Okay, so I forgot to record about 10 minutes of this lecture, which means I'm going to have to narrate the PowerPoints as best I can. The question is, do I have to work hard? In response to questions you had about, about quality in translation, is there a perfect translation? Uh, how will I know when the translation is good enough? And things like that. So what I'm going to do is to look at questions of how you work, of what happens in the brain when you're translating or interpreting. This puts us in the area of process studies. You remember I divided up translation studies into products, people, and processes. This is where we are over here. There are several ways of getting a view of what's going on in the translating brain. Uh, we're going to look at think aloud protocols or TAPS. This is when the person speaks while they're translating. Not much good for interpreting, obviously. And then translog, screen recording, etc. We'll look at very soon. And then after we do the experiment with the translator or interpreter, we usually have an interview. So we get their account of what they think they were doing. So we'll start with uh, a screen recording first, uh, from which we generate a think aloud protocol. Let's see if this one works. To enjoy it. Enjoy. So what we had there was the translator speaking about what they were doing. Actually, she wasn't saying very much, just the words she was translating. Uh, but on other occasions, um, they give reasons for thinking of a certain solution and reasons for discarding other solutions. That's then written up, as you can see here, this would be the protocol with elements of the start text here, the target text and the verbalizations over here, and the time taken. Another tool that's used is called Translog. Here you can see an example of its output. What it does is keep a track of the keystrokes, as you can see here, the, the actual text, and the time taken between them. So when there's more time taken, we assume the problem is uh, the translator has paused to solve a problem. Trouble is they could also be having a sip of a cup of coffee. Keystroke logging, uh, not, not translog, but other forms of keystroke logging, is these days integrated into most free a screen recording software, which can also have a image, an image of the uh, translator's face, etc. And uh, Translog itself uh, has been integrated into a package with eye tracking, which we'll see just now. So here is the blue dot, which shows where the eye is looking, the dot and the line. You can see that the translator here is processing the first sentence in a fairly linear way, one after the other, gets to the end of the sentence, goes back, doesn't start, start translating immediately, and has to process a few more pieces of information with quite a number of loops. Once they start on the text, the uh, translation text, uh, they don't just produce the meaning of the sentence. Here you can see they're going backwards and forwards, rather like someone trout fishing in a stream, throwing out the hook to get another piece of information or confirmation of what they're doing. All in all, the translation is far more complex than we thought it would be otherwise. I have stolen this video from Art Luca Jakobsen in Copenhagen, there are many other things you can do with eye tracking. One of them is, is, is just straight reading. Here you can see a man reading this text, an interview with Miley Cyrus, and the small numbers are at the top left, the big numbers are down at the bottom right, and the reading process goes in a fairly straight linear way.
Now you can see the same man translating. This time it's an interview with Amy Winehouse. Look how much more complex it is. And the lines are not going uh, from top left to bottom right. There are lots of pauses and back loops. Translating is a far more complex process than reading is. Actually, though, we were interested in who looks at the photo of the person being interviewed in this text. This is a woman translating the text about, or interview with Amy Winehouse. This is a man. What do you notice? Women look at the photo. And uh, we did this as a, a quick experiment just to check um, to try to see if the person who's translating personifies the text. That is, do they translate the words on the page as objects, as the man seems to do, or do they translate it as the voice of a person, as the woman seems to do in this case? Now, that, those are just experiments. We can get lots of different pieces of information and suggestion and hypotheses. I, I don't really know if personification is happening. The eye tracking is telling us something though, and then we have to interpret what it is telling us. Over the years there have been quite a few studies of this kind using these various techniques, but most of them with think aloud protocols and then increasingly with eye tracking and, uh, and translog. I'd just like to go through some of the main conclusions uh, that have been found in a set of studies that compare novice translators, beginning translators, people like you perhaps, with uh, more experienced or professional translators. And the interest of these studies is that if we can locate the difference between the way a novice translates and the way a professional translates, and this would apply to interpreting as well, uh, then in theory we know what you need training in in order to get that to that professional or expert status. Now, um, professionals or people who have more experience tend to use paraphrase uh, as a, a more frequent strategy, uh, whereas uh, novices tend to be more literal or word for word. This was an early finding, uh, and it's what we would expect. Uh, there's something called primitive literalism. People start from the supposition that everything in that start text uh, has to be rendered in some way in the target text, uh, and then they realize that, uh, well, you can cheat. No, you can use a range of translation solutions that I presented to you previously. A perhaps more interesting early um, finding, and you can see from the dates here, uh, was that the more experienced translators use a larger translation unit. The translation unit here would be the, the amount of text which is processed in order to um, uh, solve the translation problem. So in the eye tracking video we saw the translation unit was clearly the sentence. The, the translator read to the end of the sentence before processing that information. Although for some of the minor translation decisions, the unit went down to the phrase level. Uh, we find that novice translators tend to work on translation units that are smaller, whereas uh, professionals will look at the sentence and beyond that, the group of sentences, the paragraph, indeed the whole text as a basis for problem solving. Another thing that has been looked at is the revision process, the process of correction after you finish translating the text. How long do people spend going over it? Uh, it's been found, and you've got the references here, that professionals spend more time on the revision process, that is post-draft revising. They give more importance to it than the novices do, and yet they make fewer changes while they're doing it. Novices are very good of going at correcting A to B and then back to A, kind of boomerang operation. Uh, novices, um, professionals, display more confidence, but more awareness of the need to see the whole text. 
and this fits in with the idea of the larger translation unit for the professionals. It's no surprise that the professionals tend to read a text faster, but that's normal. If you do something all the time, you get faster at it. But it was initially thought that learning how to translate was like learning how to ride a bike. Remember when you were learning to ride a bike and you kept falling off and it hurt? You have to get on again and try it. And then once you're on and you know you can keep your balance, you can go fast. Then you have to learn how to use the brakes, and, uh, which is the other problem. Uh, or, or go up, I had to go up hills. I didn't know how to put the brakes on. Uh, the idea was that the task becomes more automatic, or driving a car. You know, most of you, if you drive a car, at the beginning, very difficult, all these different things you have to control. And then the car becomes an extension of your body. And you can feel the limits of the car as if it were yourself, and you're not thinking even about where you're going. It just happens sort of automatically. Uh, it was thought that translating would become automatized like that, and therefore faster. The actual finding is that this is not the case. It's not like driving a car, and it's not like riding a bike. Uh, because some routine tasks are automatic, and, and experienced translators come up with solutions very quickly to those routine, repetitive problem problems. For example, I, did I give you a, a translation solutions? I don't know. I, I work between Spanish and English, okay? Spanish has reflexive verbs. Se dice. It is said that, okay? But it really means to itself says. Se dice. Manzat. So, but after a while, you don't think, oh, it's a reflexive. English doesn't have the reflexive. What do I do? No, you say, oh, reflexive, that's a passive. And it's riding a bike. And we all build up these automatic routine solutions. Uh, easily done, just practice will do it. You don't need a teacher for that. But what happens is the professionals save time on those routine tasks and then use it to solve the big juicy problems, which are not easy, which have no, they don't have one, two, or three solutions. You know, you have to think about the ethics of it, or think about who the reader is, or think about what additional information might be needed. So, um, novices tend to have an equal allocation of time across the text. Everything is a problem. Whereas professionals will go fast on the routine and slow on the big problems. Okay, there's a distinction between routine problems and uh, you know, one-off or important or critical or, as I will say later, high-risk problems. Okay, any questions about this? You're all enthralled. This means, as well that the decision-making process um, works more top-down than bottom-up. Do you know what this means, top-down and bottom-up? Yes, you all do. If I work bottom-up, I solve the small problems, and my solutions then help me solve the big problems, which helps me solve the big, big problems. Okay, that's bottom-up. I work from identification of letters and morphemes and the word unit, then the syntactic unit, the phrase and the clause and the sentence and the paragraph, then the chapter, then the text. Okay? Top down says, ah, this is a situation where this person wants to communicate that to this person, and this is the text, and here's the beginning of the text, and here's the da da da, and you get down to the little thing you solve. All decision making in translation concerns both. There is no such thing as pure top-down because you need a text and there's no such thing as pure bottom-up because we always make assumptions about the situation and the communication act. Both are always present but in the think aloud protocols the professionals make more reference to top-down thinking than the novices. The novices are worried about words professionals about communicative situations. Lots of evidence for that one.
uh, professionals um, tend to rely on their own intuition about a topic. What sounds right for them? What fits in with what they know about it? Whereas novices will tend to follow more the isolated meanings of the start text. Okay? Um, in layman's term, terms, uh, professionals can risk intuition. Um, the American theorist Douglas Robinson talked about translating with your gut. He talks about the somatics of translation, that sometimes it feels right. And it feels right because you have a feeling, not a Sprachgefühl, as you say in German, but a feeling of what's right in that situation. And sometimes a professional will stop and not know why. You know, logically, this is the solution, but we'll think, no, it doesn't feel right. And Robinson will say, you're translating not with your brain, not with your logic, you're translating with your, with your, your innards. No, what you're doing is you're translating with these deaf feelings we have about situations, cultures, languages, and it's this complex, acquired, um, interiorized competence that we have that is beyond rational logic. Uh, for that reason, the professionals will tend to trust their intuitions more about the world. We'll have examples in a minute. For that, well, also, it's not for that reason, uh, in the Think Aloud protocols, professionals can say more about what they're doing. They have more words to describe what they're doing. It's not this thing there, or I don't know. They can talk about text and phrase and function, communication participants. They actually have their own theories, as I said in the first lecture. They're able to theorize better and to often offer principles. Uh, in this case, I prefer something like adaptation. Or here, with words, we never do this. Uh, whereas a novice will simply express doubt and perhaps take a guess. The professional is also guessing, but they tend to defend themselves better. This is why a professional is able to refer to the client as a factor in the decision-making. Uh, novices will not usually just refer to the text. The translation decision is often made by referring just to what's in the start text. A professional can think about the end user, but novices can do that too, or the client. What will the client think about this, or shall I add a note to the client? And this is a kind of summarizing of the professional's activity. There more realistic, I think in the sense of knowing there's not a perfect translation and that in many situations something is good enough. Uh, Self-conscious, they're aware of the limitations of their knowledge, but they're prepared to trust it when necessary. And also self-critical. They can mark things and say, oh, in the revision I'll have to come back to that and see it. Move on. Okay, Self-critical, not in the sense of getting stuck on something, but say, yes, I know it's not perfect, but we'll come back to it in the end. And these are not linguistic skills, not cultural skills. These are decision-making skills that tend to be picked up through experience. And if you're lucky, in the classroom. I want to move on to some of the experiments I do in class. I teach a class in Monterey, uh, which is based on students doing research on their own processes. And I just want to focus on one uh, where I try to train them to go faster. I claim everybody can translate 30% faster with no loss of quality. And this upsets my students because in their other classes they're trained to produce absolute accuracy no matter how long it takes them, and I try to impress them. It's a, I'll, I'll explain this. Okay. I get them to translate a 200-word text. They see how long it takes them, take the time. Minus 30%, so they all have their own individual goal. 
Okay? Some people are naturally slower than others. That's not a problem. I just want 30% slower. Then, a second text, 200 words, and I pressure them. I say, here's your goal, and I get a big whip, and walk behind them, and phew. No, I just keep telling them, the clock's going down. And they really start sweating and panicking. And, things. and they all finish 30%. Okay? And then they peer-review the translations. I'm a very lazy teacher. And they don't know, they do it in such a way as they don't know if it's a fast or a slow translation. And I can prove to them that the results are the same. The number of changes are the same for the slow and the fast. In general. No significant difference. Almost. Okay. Usually it works. <laughs> to do that, and then I get them to write up recommendations about how to translate fast. Because I'm a lazy teacher, I don't tell anybody how to do it, I get the students to do it. And if there weren't so many of you, I would do it with you right here today, but there are a lot of you. Okay. Now, to do this analysis, um, I take the traditional stages in a translation activity. One of the early theorists talked about Vorlauf, Hauptlauf, Nachlauf, uh, Halaf is running, isn't it? So, uh, that's a bit... We, we need actually a bit more to do what I'm doing. So I divide it up into a pre-translation phase, which is everything that is done prior to translating the first word. Okay? So that could be reading the text. You saw the person with the eye tracking. They actually read it, they do a bit of processing. Uh, some people spend a long time there, others don't. Then you've got the draft phase, the end roof, okay, the draft, which is actually translating the text. But within that, I want to know how long they spend looking up items, looking for information. So there's this uh, documentation, recherche arbeit, if you will. Um, and that's easy to tell. Anything, if you're working in Word, anything outside of Word, and you just add up how long. Why do I do that? Because some students are Googling every little thing, and I want to tell them, trust your intuition instead of trusting Google, not because Google's wrong, it just it takes too long. Okay? Uh, and the final phase is the revision phase, technically defined as everything that's done after the last word has been translated. So I get the students to record their performance, screen recorder, free, play it back four times as fast, and count how many seconds they spend on each of these four phases for the fast and the slow task. This gives you a translator profile. We find some translators uh, spend a lot of time, they're architects, it's a term. They spend a lot of time preparing it, designing it, and then work really fast. Okay, they do a lot of pre-translation phase, but there are actually not many architects around in our classes. Uh, others are then watercolorists. They have virtually no pre -pre preparatory pre-translation phase, very little revision phase. It's, that's it, no, inspiration. You know, you paint with watercolors, aquarelles. You know, you can't touch it. It's got to be perfect first time, and that's it. We have translators like that, some of the greatest. Uh, you know. um, then there are oil painters. Oil painters start straight away, but oil paint, you can paint one color on top of another. So you can change everything. So the oil painters are people who have virtually no preparation, and then they do lots and lots of revision. Okay, and the one remaining one are the bricklayers. You have to look at somebody building a wall with bricks to understand this. It takes a long time to get everything there, the bricks, the cement, the measurements, etc. Very quick putting the brick on, and then a long time cleaning it up to make it look good. So a bricklayer is a lot of preparation, very quick translation, a lot of revision. Okay, we have these typologies. They actually come from the theory of, uh, of, of writing. 
Uh, these are categories drawn from the way people write texts, but we can apply them to, uh, to, to translation. So students then look at the style that they have. Oh, I'm a bricklayer, I'm a watercolorist, help, I'm an architect, whatever. And uh, they can change that if they want in other experiments. We find that when they go 30% faster, they change their translator style in quite consistent ways. One is not no surprise. The pre-translation phase all but disappears. Okay? That bit is the obvious thing to reduce, and they all do that. The actual drafting phase tends not to change. They, it, it remains the same. They spend just as long actually doing the translation because there comes a point at which you can't go faster there. But they reduce their documentation a lot. Somebody who is Googling everything, you tell them not to trust your intuition. They do just as well. Okay, And this is where the big gains are made. And then minimal gains are made on the um, up fashion. What do we do? The revision. Everything that happens after it. What's interesting is that this happens for all the translator styles. When they're translating normally, people have very different approaches. But when you force them to go fast, it converges into something like... Uh, um, a professional activity. It's also because it's harder to distinguish between these phases. People move very quickly between them. Why? Because the documentation has all but disappeared. The take home, the take away, that's it, the message is uh, trust your intuition or learn how and when to trust your intuition and that's the big message to get across. It doesn't, you don't tell people panic, you get your adrenaline going, it'll turn you on. No, it just says, take it easy, make intelligent decisions, don't put in anything, but trust your intuition in these key phases. Only look up stuff when you're really unsure and you need guidance. This comes back to what we found in Queensley, saying that the professionals are more realistic, uh, more self-aware, and more self-critical. I think the speed activity encourages precisely those elements uh, in the work phase. There's more research on time. Some of, it, some of it's worrying, but here's, here's a, a piece of research done in Granada in 2003. What's interesting here is that Deruz found that 19%, a bit more, of the students perform better under time pressure. 30% difference again. Okay? And 25% maintain the same quality. So some people really perform much better when they're under time pressure, and you might be one of them. Unfortunately, if you add up the numbers, it still means that most people perform worse. Uh, a slight majority did perform worse. Uh, in my class, I think I can show that about 30% people can do with no significant loss. Uh, Hansen's research uh, finds that students with a long initial phase do not produce better quality, but that we sort of know because professionals don't have the long initial phase. Lorenzo's research is really interesting. She gave students, other students, to revise. And some had time pressure and others didn't. Okay, so let's say we give you some translations. You've got 20 minutes, you've got 40, and you've got 60 minutes. <clears throat> Who discovers the most mistakes? These people over here, because they've got longer. But who corrects... or? Who introduces the most mistakes in the revision process? These people. Who produces the better revisions? These people. Okay? Because the longer you have to do something, the more doubts you produce, 
The more potential errors you find, the more complexities you discover, and the less you trust your intuition. So even in the revision phase, a little time pressure can be productive. And uh, Geberov uh, uh, found again in, in the study on the use of translation memories or the post-editing of machine translation uh, that the people who worked slower did not produce anything better. So there's some evidence for this conclusion that a little bit of time pressure is actually good. And for some, it can be really exciting. So far, what I said about the difference between novices and professionals would fit in with that Skopos type theory or ideology, right? That uh, the more people think about the function of the text in its situation, the more professional they will be. Okay, that's what we talked about bigger text units about deciding between slow and fast, because the fast ones are ones that are critical for the communication situation. Um, and also the fact that, that, that when people go fast, their styles converge, suggests that there is a common professional best practice around that, around working hard on the problems that are functional rather than merely linguistic replacement exercises. Now, most of the people doing that research subscribed more or less to a Scopos view of translation, functionalist view of translation, which is non-linguistic. And this worries me for the following reason. Jensen, in her doctoral research, found that under time pressure, translators operated professionally and professionals adapted to this better, but that the professionals used a translation process that was more rapid and more linear. But you know, in the eye tracking, I showed you somebody reading in a straight line, that would be linear. And then translating, going backwards and forwards, that would be non-linear. Okay? Now, we know translation is more non-linear. That's bad, isn't it? Has more loops than reading. Okay? Reading is more linear than translating. We know that. But now when we compare professional translators to novice translators, we find that the professionals are more linear than the novices. They don't go around as much. Why? Because they solve problems based on intuition and big text units. Okay? That makes sense. That the expert translators, citation, engage in less problem solving, less goal setting, and less reanalyzing behavior than do young professional translators. Okay? That the more professional you are, the less problem solving activity you get into, and the more you take the text as it comes. I find this worrying. It's the opposite to what a Scopos thing would say. Scopos says, think about the communicative situation. Personify the text. That's what I'm saying. Personify. Think about what this person would say in that kind of situation. We find that professionals are often, hey, it's got it in that order, I'll put it in that order. That's what it says literally. No idea what that means, but I'll put it here literally and I'll get away with it. And they do. That there is more linear activity, less functional analysis in professionals than in novices. So perhaps we have to go back and revise the theory a bit. The piece of research I've just cited actually draws on a theory of read of writing. Okay, this is going back 1987, by writer and Scardamalia, who asked the question: Why is writing difficult? Why do people not like writing? People like talking, but they don't really like writing, do you? Okay. Some people do. You just write a letter straight off. And they, they find that 
There are actually two kinds of writing, well, two extremes, okay? Uh, that sometime writing is there as a knowledge telling activity. I tell my kids a bedtime story. I used to when they were little. And I enjoy that, and they enjoy it. And I sit down, and I just tell the story, it comes out, I invent it as I go along, or, or as best I can remember it. And it's got to be in the order, because you can't stop and reanalyze in a bedtime story. Okay? Incredibly linear, it's got to be fluent, and it's knowledge telling. I'll tell you what happened. Okay, here's what I saw, I'll tell you what happened. One, two, three, four. Good fun. Okay? Most language production is linear in that sense. But there's also a kind of writing that is knowledge producing. You know when you start your essay and you haven't got a clue of what you're going to say, so you write down the first few sentences and they generate the next one, and that produces an interesting contradiction which you deal with in sentences 4, 5, 6, and 7. And the writing process itself is a thinking process. It produces knowledge. It actually becomes a dialogue between you, the person writing, and the page presenting you what you have written. It's not personification, it's a mirror, but in delayed time. And you're dialoguing with yourself as you produce this essay. You know you haven't got a clue of what you're saying, but it sounds good. And you come back three months later, and it does sound really good. And perhaps you did know something, because you discovered it when you were writing. Okay? It's hard work, because the writing is a tool for your thinking process. It's not like, I've got an idea and I'm telling it to you. It's more, the writing activity is generating the ideas as we go along. That's hard. That's why it's hard work. That's why it's productive and intellectual work. That's why most scholarship has been associated with the written mode. Now the question is, when you're translating, are you knowledge telling or knowledge transforming? For most professionals, the evidence seems to be that it is knowledge telling. I'll tell you what's in that text, as it is. Because if I start transforming it, I'm going to work too hard. I'm going to go round and be less linear. I'm going to have to think about all these communication participants, and that takes intellectual energy that you are not paying me for. Okay, there's an economic basis for this. And this might explain why Jensen found that the professionals were more linear in their approach than the novices. It might also explain why a Skopos theory doesn't explain everything professionals do. There it is. They apply the knowledge transfer as a long-term strategy. I've really said what I'm going to say. That's about it. I just want to talk about what this means for training people and how we go about communicating this strange art of knowing where to work hard and where not to work hard. Go fast on this be literal, be, you know, do, do, take it as it comes, go, f and here, work hard and think about it. I, I, I'm for a functionalism, but reduced to particularly high risk problems, where if you make a mistake, the whole thing goes bad. Work hard on that. Have I shown this to you already? Good. So I'm revising it, and now you can see why I'm interested in getting rid of the underwork getting rid of the overwork at the same time, and finding this equilibrium between the linearity and the problem-solving activity, which would happen low-risk, linearity, go fast, high-risk, 
work hard on that problem. Okay? So the research isn't justifying my model. I base the model on the research. I'm also assuming that it's possible to decide what we teach in the class on the basis of research rather than thinking, oh, I was, trans I was trained this way, therefore you'll be trans trained this way. Okay? In the master-apprentice model, or, oh, I think the market needs this, therefore we'll give you this. I think we could look at these studies, take where you are now, take where the professionals are, and see what the differences are, and say, oh, we should train you in these particular skills. What I find in most training programs is a relative absence of attention to speed, the capacity to engage in risk analysis, as I mentioned, the need to restrict the use of external resources. Often you're trained how to use a million resources, but not trained in how not to use them. But that's just as important, I think. And uh, special attention, increasing attention, has to be given to revision. The more we use translation memories and machine translation, the more important revision becomes. And I think you have to use translation memories and machine translation from the very beginning of your training. I just want to focus on the Chinese girl we saw translating. We heard her translate. This is the Think Aloud protocol of what we, she was translating. And she was dealing with a particular problem, which is the phrase, enjoy your adventure. Now, the phrase came from the website of a supermarket. Enjoy your adventure. Would you go to the spa gourmet and enjoy your adventure? Perhaps not. Uh, the Chinese girls didn't feel very happy about your adventure in the supermarket. Help, what's, what's going to happen to me? And this was the sort of stuff she was dealing with there at that time. Now, we used, some of it was think aloud with one person speaking into the screen recorder, and others were two people together talking. Okay, this is also think aloud but it's a collaborative protocol, and it's really interesting to see what they talk about. Okay? So here we go. There's two other Chinese girls, all my students, all my girls, all my, all my Chinese students are women. All right? so, hmm, enjoy your adventure. Enjoy your adventure. <gasps> Love your adventure. Ha, ha, ha. Adventure is not good. Not to say adventure. How about, hmm, so it means when you come the first time you enjoy, right. When you come the first time you enjoy, just come once and you enjoy it. What, what is she thinking about? Oh, no. It's, it's not erotic. Don't, no, no. Right, right. Because it seems to say, come to a place, then you, you enjoy making many discoveries. So it can be translated as, ah, enjoy the discoveries you make. Hmm, sounds good. Okay. Now, this is non-linear. All right? What are they doing? They're playing with the text. They're envisaging. They've personified it. They said, oh, you're in the supermarket. Oh, we're in the supermarket. What are we doing? Looking at stuff. We're enjoying it. Yes. Okay. And they get to their translation. All right? This is an enactment of it. It's not just personification in the sense of, I can imagine Amy Winehouse saying this. It's saying, oh, we're in the actual store. That gives you a certain solution and a transformation. The same text has the phrase, shop fearlessly. Shop fearlessly. You understand it, don't you? Come in and buy. Don't be afraid. Guys. Which gave solutions, thanks to the kind of dialogue you just saw, happy shopping, Enjoy your tour. Wish you happiness when you do the shopping. Enjoy your tour in the shop. Nobody wanted to say shop fearlessly because that didn't make any sense to them. How could it make sense? Does it make sense to you? So they felt they had to transform that 
because it was too risky, a high-risk solution. And you can see that we've, we've got their risk analysis. These are all risk avoidance strategies. They didn't want to go linear. They thought it didn't sound right. It didn't fit in with their gut, if you like Doug Robinson, or it didn't fit in with their imagined supermarket experience. So they adopt risk avoidance strategies and put something else that sounded better for them in China. The uh, instructions were, this supermarket is going to open in Beijing, please translate its website. So they had to adapt the American supermarket to the Chinese taste. Okay? And they did okay. Others, though, adopted more... Um, this love your adventure is much closer to the, what, what we found in the English and is more a risk transfer strategy. Their idea was, oh, well, they talk about adventure in the source text, the start text, so we'll talk about it here. And if they criticize it, we can say, well, it's in the text. Okay, Don't blame me, it's there. And this is the way they were thinking about it in that particular instance, and as opposed to enjoy the discoveries you make. Okay, Enjoy your adventure. Uh, professionals would often go with that risk transfer strategy because it takes too long to come up with something else. The actual phrase is, it gets worse, get hungry, shop fearlessly. Uh, one translator said, Wah! get hungry, audaciously, whatever that is in Chinese there. This was exaggeration, risk taking. Okay, this translator pushed it more extreme and became a risk-taking translator, extreme nonlinearity, extreme analysis of it, and somebody else just got, get hungry, act now, which doesn't make much sense at all. Okay. Now, I'm going to reveal what's going on here. This is the supermarket where all my students go shopping. It's about 150 meters from where I teach them, okay? So they all know about it. They know it's called Trader Joe's, and they know its whole publicity campaign is sort of based on the Wild West adventure thing. Okay, and it has a, it's a flyer. A flyer is this bit of paper, but it's also, well, in other places they have uh, an old-style airplane taking great risks flying. The whole thematics of the store, of the company, is Wild West adventures go there and find stuff you wouldn't normally buy. And they do. They import some really good products that are really quite exotic. It, it is an adventurous place to go. My Chinese students go there, but apparently it's not exotic for them because they're from China. Uh, okay. If you bear that in mind as the entire publicity campaign being based on being fearless and taking risks, then I would have expected the translators to take the same risks by being literal. That is, I would have thought that the best, most professional translation strategy was to follow it almost exactly, and not to make these presuppositions about it not sounding right in China. That's the only reason somebody in Beijing is going to go to this, because it doesn't sound like a Chinese shop. It sounds like the Wild West Cowboy supermarket. And that's the only reason they would, well, they would go to. For the translators doing that activity, we therefore do the analysis and get a risk profile. So this is the girl you heard translating by herself. And we look at the solutions that they first propose, and then the solutions that they accept, whether the solutions are taking risks, uh, minimizing risks, or risk transfer. The last one there, over there, should be risk transfer. Okay. Uh, this particular translator is very risk averse, as you can see. And most translators tend to be risk-averse in the middle. Okay. Uh, 
a very few of these translators adopted what I thought was the appropriate strategy, which was risk transfer over here. But it's very hard to train somebody to do that. Perhaps the best training is to do exactly what we did. We gave them an exercise, a simulation exercise. We got them to do the translations. And then one of the groups became the company, and the company had to decide which translation suited its purposes best. Uh, you place your translators in the position of the client, looking at the translations and seeing if it serves their purpose. Okay? Uh, so the kind of pedagogy that I think can teach you how not to work too hard is based a lot on simulation activities, situational activities, and translation with immediate feedback. Also, I think we should get used to working fast because that's what market requires. In any field, the perfect translation doesn't really have much, but that's a very restricted market. But fast, quick, efficient work has a huge market uh, for it. And the other aspects that I mentioned, notably technology and some kind of intuitive risk analysis. The takeaway, ladies and gentlemen, you can do it. Just trust your intuition. Thank you very much.